My prayer is that really we return to grace and love and unity among each other and put our differences aside and really realize that our differences are what make us unique and that that's a good thing and that creates balance in the world the same way my father was law and my mother was grace it wasn't that either one of them was right or wrong or better or worse it was that we all need each other that that is possible brooke burns is my special guest today on cia contagious influencers of america the podcast from the producers of Keep the Faith, I'm David Sams. Now, many of you may remember Brooke from uh, her roles. Uh, you know, she had starring roles in the TV shows. Oh, gosh, uh, what were they? Uh, uh, oh, Alec Mc- McBeal. Remember Alec McBeal? Uh, she was also on Melrose Place. But the one I remember her from, how could you forget, was uh, Baywatch. Remember Baywatch? Yeah, that was pretty cool. But now she's the host of Masterminds, which is on the Game Show Network. It's a it's a really really it's just huge. It's it's a really really highly popular game show on the Game Show Network. And she's done several game shows. She did another one called Dog Eat Dog a while back. Uh, she also did You Deserve It with uh, Chris Harrison, and she does this other thing called The Chase. She's been nominated for an Emmy as Outstanding Game Show Host, and she's also starred in a ton of movies, TV movies, uh, for Hallmark and Lifetime. You've seen her in, uh, oh, what's that franchise, that that series she has, uh, Gourmet Detective, and her earlier films include uh, A Sister's Revenge, The Most Wonderful Time of the Year, and Christmas Connection. I love her in these Christmas uh, films. And uh, she's currently uh, uh, living in uh, Los Angeles with her uh, husband and her three girls. And that's pretty cool. And I, I really connected with her. We had so much to share, so much in common. Our histories, our, our backgrounds are so similar. So we really hit it off, and I had a lot of fun with her. So she's going to be my special guest here in just a minute. But first, I have to tell you about... My pillow, uh, you know, my pillow is just one of those things that I can't go to bed without. I've got to have, you know, my my pillow every night, and of course, my pillow is one of the great American success stories created by my friend Mike Lindell, and Mike has a, a wonderful a wonderful testimony, and he's the real deal. You know, my, Mike's been a friend, and he he wanted to offer us something very special to. Uh, give to our listeners here on CIA and on our radio show, Keep the Faith. So he said, David, I'm going to do something that I normally don't do, and that's I'm going to offer my queen-size pillow that normally runs $69.98 for only $29.98. And I'm only going to do this for a limited time, but I'm going to do this, and I'm, I'm going to give a great guarantee on the back end. He just said, I, I want everybody to have this. I want all your listeners to get a good night's sleep, so go for it. So, you know, the MyPillow comes with a 10-year warranty. Uh, it's washable, and it's dryable. I'll tell you, it's the really cool thing is that your pillow, your pillow that you're going to get was made right here in the USA, which means American workers actually put your pillow, manufactured your pillow, and that's that's pretty cool stuff. In this day and age. So, uh, you know, check it out. You can go to MyPillow.com and just click on the radio listeners special square and use the promo code Keep the Faith. That's for really important if you want this deal. Just go to MyPillow.com and click on the radio listeners special square. Type in the promo code Keep the Faith. Or you can call 1-800-422-5310. That's 1-800-422-5310. And thank you, Mike Lindell for supporting us here on CIA, Contagious Influencers of America, and on Keep the Faith Radio. Let's get to my interview now with Brooke Burns. Hey, Brooke, how are you? Hi, David. How are you? I am. Uh, I, I couldn't be any better right now, to tell you the truth, and I know that... In this uh, state we're in, that's that's a pretty big, bold statement. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, in 2020, if you can say, like, I'm doing great or better now than ever, then that says a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> 
You know, this has been a year of pivoting and this has been a year of, uh, oh gosh, you know, I was literally in lockdown for, and, and you know, here in Nashville, eh, we're not really that much in lockdown, at least uh, in the county I'm in. Right. But I took it pretty seriously for several months and yeah. with, with the exception of going out and walking every day. And by the way, I've just hit since March the 23rd, 1200 miles of walking. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Oh my God. But this really has been a year of uh, pivoting and uh, fewer distractions and obviously staying close to home. So, enough yeah. about me. What's it been like for you? Well, exactly the same. You know, I think that, like many people in the beginning of this, it was sort of, I mean, you know, obviously separate from. Uh, the tragedy of people who were getting ill and losing, you know, lives for those of us who, who have, you know, been lucky enough to um, stay healthy. I think that it's been a real, um, as you said, it's been a real shift in, in paradigm of like what our lives are about, how fast the rat race has become, you know, with the multiple ways to keep up with, you know, whatever it is, TV content coming in, um, people working, multiple jobs, multitasking. And I think that, you know, for me and my family, it's been kind of nice to hit the reset button and go back to the very slow, <laughs> you know, internal world of just our household. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as, as much as, you know, I, I um, have incredible empathy for those that it has, you know, touched in a, in a very negative way. I think for many families, it's been kind of um, a good time of reflection of like, you know, what are we about? Uh, what are we doing? Are we doing what we're passionate, you know, about and what we love and are the things that we're involving ourselves in um, worth the very short time that we all do have, you know, yeah. not to get like too deep right away. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's good stuff. And uh, so, so really, uh, you know, as you've had time to reflect on, because I mean, you have such a diverse background, and, and <laughs> that's true. You know, between the the movies and the game show and everything else that you've done, um, what has hit you over the past few months? Because I I know your your highly popular game show Masterminds is back in production now. Yes. Um, after being on, I guess, I don't know if you call it hiatus or a lockdown or. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, amazingly, we were so, I feel so blessed because we shot um, my first season with Masterminds in February. And um, then we had a natural hiatus, which we normally would have had anyway. And then as you know, things sort of started to get a little bit better, we went ahead and just literally wrapped our um, you know, for me, the second season, the third season of the show. And, um, and now it seems that the numbers are going up again. So it, we've been really lucky to be able to sort of like get in and get out, you know, and shoot two seasons this year. And I'm very grateful, you know, for the work and, and, um, I think everybody was, and there was a real sense this time around of like, you know, thank you God that, uh, that we shoot 65 shows in three weeks and we can kind of get in and get out and, you know, obviously a little different with the masks and the shields and the testing every two days. But um, we were all very, felt very blessed to be able to be working. You didn't wear a mask on the air, did you? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be really hard to do, especially in round three for the speed round. I mean, real, nobody would be able to understand me. Yeah, no, it felt kind of weird. I felt like the entire time I actually had the plague or something because I, I had, you know, one of our PAs running in front of me going, clear the way, clear the way. <laughs> and he, because I was the only one not, you know, in hair and makeup wearing a mask. So, but still getting tested every two days and, um, you know, it, it, I think the hardest part about shooting during this crazy pandemic is I love people so much and I'm a hugger. So I always want to like connect with the contestants and give them high fives or a hug if they win. And just having that like, yay, air high five. <laughs> I'm sending you a hug, blowing you a kiss. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. It's a little harder to feel that connection. Take me back to the beginning and I want to get to um, your, your, roots a little bit, your family sure. upbringing, uh, your, your parents, what the home life was like. 
Absolutely. and what influence it, it had on you and, and how you got into what you're doing. Sure. Thank you. So I grew up in Dallas, Texas. My family is five generations of Texans. So we've got deep roots there, Wichita Falls, Amarillo, all over the place, Marble Falls. And um, my parents met, <clears throat> I have one of those great stories where my parents met in first grade. They danced together in fourth grade at camp. They started dating when they were 16. They got married when they were barely 19 and they're still together. Um, they went to SMU together. So that's how we ended up in Dallas. And when I was probably two and a half, my mom took me to go and see the Nutcracker Ballet at the Dallas Metropolitan Ballet there, right across the street from SMU at McFarland Auditorium. And I was mesmerized by it, even at that young age. And so my mom put me into dance classes and that was sort of my passion growing up. I was, um, as you say, a hardcore ballerina, <laughs> seven days a week. I used to sleep, you know, turned out. I used to do pirouettes around, PK turns around the kitchen counter every day. <laughs> and um, that was sort of my obsession. Um, that was really the only kind of performing. My dad uh, works in the oil business. He also uh, is a missionary and started a church when he was just out of college locally in Dallas. And um, my mom was a, a banker and then became a stay-at-home mom. So I wasn't really exposed to, you know, the entertainment world in that way where it was, you know, known to be like an occupation of sorts. <laughs> mm -hmm. I thought I was going to grow up and, and teach ballet and have six kids and live in Texas for the rest of my life. But usually God has other plans than our own. <laughs> that, that's right. It's funny. You, um, you mentioned that, um, <clears throat> excuse me. That's okay. I've got the same thing going on. I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been tested. I'm good. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I feel safe. I feel safe. <laughs> We're a couple thousand miles apart here. So yeah. <laughs> if we can't do this, no one can. <laughs> It's funny. We have very similar backgrounds. Uh, my my parents, they were together literally since the fourth grade. Oh my gosh! Um, my mom that. and dad went to. Uh, they lived in a small small town, but uh, uh, my dad became a pastor. Oh my goodness! And, uh, You're a PK kid. I'm a PK kid, and also, <laughs> and also, I have a younger sister who is uh, 18 years younger than I am. So. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I love that. And I, wow. I mean, your kids are what, 17 years apart or something? Yeah. I've got a 20 year old, a stepdaughter who's 18 and then a three and a half year old. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a whole nother, you know, I've got a whole nother 20 years ahead of me here, which I love. It, I, what, what was the react? I, I, I will tell you when I was in high school, I came home one day, I was what a senior and my mom and dad set me down and they said, we have something to tell you. And uh, my mom said, um, you know, we're pregnant and we're going to have a baby. And I looked at my dad and I go, how could you? That is just <laughs> ridiculous. That's terrible. That is like awful. You know, because I thought they were so old. You know, they were what, in the You're mid thirties. Like, how is that even possible? You guys can't possibly still be, you know, able to do that, right? <laughs> what what well, reaction did you get from your from your oldest? So it was interesting because my oldest really liked being an only child with me. I was a single mom for many years with her and um, we were very, very close. And I think she was really, I mean, when she first heard the news, she was super excited and started, she's emotional like I am. So she started crying and she was like, this is, you know, so beautiful and wonderful. I don't think it was until Declan, my little one was born where she was like, oh, you're not all about me anymore. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> this whole baby thing is like taking over your life. And I'm like, yeah, I did this with you for 20 years. And now you know, it's like another, um, another little body in the room. So it was an adjustment. I never thought in a million years that there could be, you know, sibling rivalry that many years apart because it's not like she was taking her toys or, you know, <laughs> anything like that. But, um, you know, it's, it's very interesting trying to parent a teenager. And I always make the joke. I was, you know, 
breastfeeding and doing college applications at the same time, which is just <laughs> mind boggling. <laughs> You are uh, very outspoken about your faith and the, the role that uh, uh, God plays in your life. You know, I know I was in Hollywood for many years. By the way, my, you know, I spent many years uh, launching uh, some game shows. I Jeopardy, right? Merv, I worked with Merv and the King Brothers, so I launched oh a wheel God. in Jeopardy. And, Unbelievable. You know, wow. I, 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 so I find your background to be really uh, interesting. And, but, but, you know, I, I was a, a PK, a Christian in Hollywood. And you know what, back when I was, and then, then again, I've been in Nashville for 10 years now, you know, everybody goes to church here, but. Right. Uh, Wait, David, tell me where you grew up. Where, where was your dad a pastor? In Ohio. Oh, Ohio. Okay. Yeah. Right. Ohio. I'm a Buckeye. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So I, I moved, I moved to, uh, uh, I moved to um, Southern California in my early twenties when I got a job with uh, launching wheel, believe it or not. Oh, wow. It, well, I, you know what? It was a small, small company. Uh, King World was, uh, I think I was employee number nine. No way. Yeah. And here I am. Here I am hanging out with Merv Griffin every day because I was literally the guy that would go over to uh, Merv Griffin Enterprises and, and meet with Bur Merv and the production staff at least three, four times a week when oh we were God. launching these shows. How fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Uh, but you know, back in those days, if if you were a uh, if you were a person of faith in Hollywood, you know, you were it, it w wasn't a big deal. You know, I mean, yeah. and I know things have changed a little bit, but you're very outspoken about your faith and the role that it plays in your life. What do you encounter these days in the Hollywood community, and how do you embrace the opportunity to spread the good news? You know, it's interesting. I think that as you're, I think what you're, you know, sort of trying to say is like the perception of a Christian in Hollywood has always been, I think mostly just that we're really square. <laughs> 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 and, um, you know, I guess for me, I, I grew up, you know, so inundated in that world. I mean, we went to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Bible studies. I was part of the youth group. My dad was a missionary. We moved to Romania when I was 13 years old. Um, being on the mission field for me was very different than, you know, growing up and going to a big church in North Dallas. But especially because my dad started the church with his best friend, I just, I didn't know any other way. And one thing that I will say about my family is that, you know, as in, you know, every area of life, I think that you have the people that are really genuinely authentic, and then you have some hypocrites. And so I think that that at times can, you know, turn people off if you get involved with the wrong group. But the thing that I've always said about my parents is that they live with so much integrity that they aren't the, as you say, like Bible thumpers that go around and they're like, hi, nice to meet you. Jesus is Lord. You know, like, <laughs> right, right. They just really lived God's love, his, uh, the wisdom. I think that you can gain from growing up with principles that are biblical. And, um, I had so many people just growing up going like, I, I love your parents. They're just so warm and welcoming and I don't know what it is about them you know but like I just want to be around them like they just make me feel good they're always so you know encouraging and uplifting and supportive and you know and strict too but <laughs> yeah but, let's uh, not forget that part yeah exactly <laughs> but, but again always came with like a lesson and I, I think that it wasn't until I really got out into the world where I realized that not every family was like that. And um, so in a way, it was surprising to me, but I didn't have any of that, I guess, apprehension about sharing where I came from because it was just always so positive to me, you know? Yeah. And I felt like that, you know, as my dad used to say, like, whether you believe it or not, the principles work. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and my dad and our family was sort of like the law and my mom was grace. And that balance really, I think, taught me a lot about, you know, respect and integrity and like being a woman of my word. And at the same time, not, 
taking that and using it as judgment toward anybody else's life or experience, but really just trying to uh, be open and have empathy and that, um, you know, kind of unconditional love um, for human beings uh, from a spiritual perspective, you know, and right. Oof, again, no, no. No, yeah. no we're, 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 we're very much on the same wavelength. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I totally relate to what you're saying. And, and I totally relate to the parent thing because everybody thinks I have the coolest parents, and, which I do, <laughs> by the way. Yep, me too. <laughs> I, I, always, I always tell people, yeah, uh, you remember the TV series, The Waltons? Yeah. I grew up in that family. I know. I used to always say, <laughs> leave it to Beaver. Welcome to our home. <laughs> <laughs> It's so true. But yeah, you know, I think I, I feel like, or I hope to um, portray the same thing where I've had people come up to me and say, you have such a strong work ethic and you're always just positive and you always look at like the glass is half full and wow, you're just really like lovely to be around. And that I think is just an absolute reflection of, you know, the work ethic that they instilled in me and the, and the positive attitude, you know. Speaking of work ethic, first of all, how would you how would you describe your background, your career? Because it is so diverse. <laughs> I mean, you've got to do things that you know very few people get to do. True. You know, you you've got to and you've got to do A B C. You know, A B C and D in Hollywood. Yeah, I've checked off a lot of boxes. From your acting in TV, your films, your 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 game show, uh, your your modeling. I mean, you've done you've done everything. So, are you just one of the lucky few, or has God given you uh, some unique gifts? And in, in, in which I'm sure that there are many more that you've yet to discover. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, I think that. Um, Definitely. I mean, as I said, I really thought growing up, I would be a stay at home mom and maybe teach ballet a couple times a week. Um, because, you know, that's what I saw my mother do. It wasn't even that I had some kind of crazy ambition for this world. I think that being a dancer and the amount of discipline that that takes, um, really, I found uh, my niche very early. I was very blessed in that way because I had a love and a passion for something. So I was willing to work as hard as possible to excel in that world. And that meant, you know, sacrificing Friday night football games, which in Texas is a tough thing to do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. and, you know, school sleepovers because I had Saturday morning ballet, but I just felt like in the same way, and again, something my dad always taught me is like, if you commit to something, you give it, you become, you know, treat it with excellence. And because I loved it so much, it wasn't hard for me to do, but, but the amount of discipline and work that had to go into it to excel was something that I think has just been so advantageous to me in so many other areas of my life that I just tried to apply that you know, everywhere. And another thing, again, that other biblical principle that my father used to always say is to whom much is given, much is required. So it always felt like with every step of blessing that I had, that I had a responsibility to use that platform to give back and do something good with it, whether it was, you know, I made this amount of money and being able to tithe that or help someone or give to charity, or it was a platform that was, you know, um, a visible platform where you can use your name or your time or whatever it is to your voice to speak to things that you care about. So, you know, between, yeah, between growing up with like the biblical principles and then the, the work ethic of what I think ballet, you know, taught me though at times difficult, the rewards have been very great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And those yeah, just kind of opened naturally for me. You know, I, I also suffered a lot of, you know, I tore my ACL and my left knee snow skiing, which kind of sidetracked my dance career for a moment. And um, that's how I got into the modeling. I went through, uh, you know, some depression after being told I wasn't going to be able to dance for a year when that was really my identity and my life at that time. And so my mom put me in like a little modeling camp for a week. And then I realized that someone would pay me $125 to play dress up in pajamas, you know, <laughs> <laughs> for JC Penney's newspaper, you know, uh, articles. And I was like, oh, that's kind of 
silly, but fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, discovered making money. And then the modeling was like, okay, well, do you want to do this job in New York? And then, well, this job is in the Seychelles Islands, you know, and you're like, wait, what? You're going to pay me to travel? <laughs> You know, isn't uh, it isn't it interesting when you have uh, when you can look back and you see how uh, you know God connected the dots. Uh, you know, you know when you're looking forward. Of course, we have no idea what's what's ahead. But when you look right? back, you you can see sort of how how God connected the dots and and had your back. Oh, the knee injury to me was the greatest, you know, the, the most horrible thing that could ever happen. And I, I always look back now going, you know, laughing like God's up there going, just wait, just hang on. I have a little bit of a different destiny for you. It's bigger and better than you think. You know, you're not just going to be at home with six little kids running around. <laughs> but give me a minute to like let it pan out. And of course, you know, I would have never left the field had it not been something, this is what I always laugh, that God knows that my last name is Burns, so I'm sometimes stubborn. <laughs> and he was like, all right, this is going to have to be dramatic to get you on this other road over here, you know? <laughs> I know that uh, you lived through a very miraculous situation, uh, what about, what was it, 15 years ago? Yes, sir. And uh, I'd like for you to take me back to that moment Tell our listeners what happened. Sure. So in 2005, Madison, my oldest, was uh, five years old, and I had a swimming routine for my workout. I would stand up paddle in my pool and then swim laps. Um, but because of that, I had my board uh, kind of jerry-rigged in the swimming pool, which might have not been the smartest thing to do, but it saved me a 45 minute drive to the beach. Um, and then, you know, one afternoon I, I just dove in as I'd done a thousand times before underneath my board, uh, from the deep end toward the shallow end. And I just misjudged the depth by about an inch and I hit the slope, um, from the shallow end to the deep end that's on the top of my head, uh, chin to chest paralyzing break. Um, I was underwater for quite a bit of time, which I, I didn't know. I was, you know, obviously in shock. I, a friend of mine who was at the house was a, fi happened to be, miraculously, one of God's angels, a fireman paramedic. The only one that I knew in my life was literally at my home at that moment. And he walked outside and he was looking for me and thought that I was showing off my amazing underwater breath holding capabilities. <laughs> <laughs> as I've bragged about before, coming from a family of swimmers. My dad was a national swimmer. But um, he knew then I wasn't coming up in enough amount of time. And he jumped in and he pulled me up and he saved my life. And then started asking me emergency questions, which I knew my name, but I wasn't sure where I was, what day it was, what month it was. And so he took the towel from the side of the pool, wet it, wrapped it around my neck and floated me on the top stair of my pool while he called 911. And I was told later by my surgeon that um, that was really what saved my mobility because I never had any weight bearing and my uh, spinal cord was bruised, but not severed. Um, I remember the paramedics there asking me to move my feet and I said, I am. And they said, move your left foot, your, move your left toes. And I said, I am. And they said, no movement, no movement. And my brain was firing, but my body was not. So I was paralyzed down my left side until I was taken into emergency surgery where they had to go in through the front and the back. And I now have a rod and two plates and 10 screws uh, in my neck. Um, and again, just a total miracle of God because every person that I know with that same break is either dead because their windpipe, you know, is impacted or um, a quadriplegic. And, you know, the three, four, five is really what um, uh, has a lot to do with your, your body's mobility. So I am not uh, naive about why that happened, uh, the, the grace that was extended to me, and as you said, the miracle of, of me being able to still walk and um, speak and <laughs> all of that. So in fact, on 11-11 every year, I have a Thanksgiving party with my friends and family to 
Um, and I always make a note of everybody put both of your feet on the ground and curl your toes in the carpet. And that's a gift that we don't often remind ourselves to appreciate that every day that we wake up and we put two feet on the ground is, um, it, you know, a blessing. Wow. That's such a, an amazing story. And, um, God wasn't done with you, and look, look, look what has happened in the last uh, 15 years to uh, oh you, gosh. your career, your family. I know. It's incredible. Yeah, I felt for a while there that I could walk across the 405-101 interchange and not get hit, you know? <laughs> if you've been in L.A., you know what I'm talking about. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I remember there was a woman who was actually, fl I was flying home to Dallas and she was afraid of flying. And I went and I sat next to her and I started talking to her. I saw that she was crying and I just went up to, to talk to her and see what was going on. And she was like, I'm so afraid of flying. And I said, what flight are you on? And it was my same flight. And I said, oh, honey, I, this is what I just went through. I said, if it was my time, God would have already taken me. It's not my time. So you're safe. You get on the airplane with me. <laughs> she started laughing. <laughs> I just have to ask you, you know, as as we uh, head into uh, a new year and uh, we, we're all hoping for, for the best and we're hoping for, uh, we're all hoping for a miracle. Yes, sir. Uh, to uh, get through all of this. Uh, what would be your prayer for your family and, and for America? You know, I feel like that best thing that can come out of this is what happened to America after 9-11, um, where you really saw people, Democrats, Republicans, independents, whatever walk of life you came from didn't really matter. We all uh, came together and there was a real unity that our country felt. And I feel like, um, Unfortunately, that some of the divisiveness that has been permeating the world this year has just um, saddened, you know, me and and my heart because I feel like going back to, I guess, those principles of God is like, you know, He looks at us all as His children, and if we can somehow get back to that perspective of we all bleed red, <laughs> you know, and um, my prayer is that really we return to uh, grace and love and unity among each other and put our differences aside and really realize that our differences are what make us unique and that that's a good thing. And that creates balance in the world the same way my father was law and my mother was grace. It wasn't that either one of them was right or wrong or better or worse. It was that we all need each other and um, that that is possible. Um, so that would be my prayer. My prayer would be, I guess, you know, to sum it up in one word, unity of heart and spirit. Well, Brooke, this has been great. And, you know, uh, thank you for being such a uh, contagious influencer and, and for uh, keeping yeah. the faith. And we, we really, we really appreciate you. And, you okay. know, the, the best to you and your family as uh, we, we go into the new year. Thank you. I wish I could interview you, David. It sounds like we, as you said, we have a lot you know, of similarities growing up, but I'm curious, like how you ended up in Hollywood, how you're doing what you're doing now, all of that. It's, it's, uh, it sounds like a fun story that you well, have. Well, one, one of these days, maybe we can do that. I actually get out there. Normally I go out to uh, LA about once a month for uh -huh. a few days. Okay. I'm still sort of quote unquote active, let's say. Dabbling but, uh, in, the, in the West Coast world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, you know, I just don't want to be active enough that I have to pay, pay California income tax. So I'm going to leave it oh, with that. <laughs> tell me about it. You don't know how many times my dad's like, just move home to Texas, have residency here. <laughs> yeah, no, that's the great thing about, that's a great thing about Tennessee. You know, it's like Texas, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I feel you. And, and we have a state legislature that, that works for about, I think, a month, sort of like Texas. I mean, we have yeah. so many similarities. It's weird. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> you guys have got good music, like the Austin scene. Oh, too. yeah, that's true. That's very true. But uh, listen, I, I really appreciate you, and uh, you keep up the good work, and I'll be watching you on Masterminds and um, in your movies, too, uh, you know, because I know you got these these things that you do with, uh, what, uh, Hallmark and... I do. And I love, yeah, working for Hallmark, too, another place that's just been very, very good to me, and doing my little gourmet detective and my Christmas movies and all of that, and... Now I, I do have one question. When you get the Christmas when you get the Christmas movie scripts, 
Uh, do you say, oh, I, don't, I, I, I really don't need to read it. I know how it's going to turn out. <laughs> You know what? It's so funny you say that because for so many scripts that get sent to me, I'm like, I have to read this to vet it, to know if there's anything that I wouldn't want on screen. And, not, and I don't have to do that with the Christmas movies. They're pretty straightforward. I know there's nothing in there that's going to be offensive or scandalous. Or <laughs> <laughs> and to tell you the truth, I'm one of those crazy lovers of decorating. I mean, I'm kind of perfect for the Hallmark brand. So I just love it. I never get tired of it. Even if it's the same, there's the Christmas decorating scene. There's the hot cocoa scene. There's, the <laughs> you know, traipsing a Christmas tree through the snow, decorating something like it's just right up my alley. So, <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. Uh, well, hey, thank you much. I really appreciate you. Okay. Absolutely. Well, look me up when you come out, David. We should have coffee or something. I'd I, love to uh, stay in touch. I will. I will absolutely do that. And thank you, Brooke. Boy, wasn't she something else? She was so much fun. So much fun. We're getting such great guests here on uh, CIA. And I want to thank you all because so many of the um, the agents and managers and show bookers are, are now trying to get on our radio show and on our podcast. It's just mind boggling what has happened over the last few months. We have more folks offering to to get on here than we have room for i I mean this month alone i think we have uh eight nine podcasts coming out i mean we were going to do this once a week but they're just lined up on the runway so i'm sure some of it has to do with the pandemic and people being locked down and bored and they're like oh man can we go get interviews somewhere else and they're like well there's this guy by the name of uh sam's out there in nashville uh he's uh he's got quite a following and, uh, you know, quite a, quite an audience, so we can get you on that. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Well, uh, well, thank you all for, for making this happen. It's because of your reviews and your comments and your ratings on our, on our podcast here that, that uh, you know, people see this stuff. And I want to really tell you how much we appreciate you for uh, rating and reviewing us on whatever platform you happen to be listening to us on. So uh, thank you very much. Hey, I'm David Sams, and this has been CIA Contagious Influencers of America, the podcast from the producers of Keep the Faith. And uh, Christmas is, well, we're we're, we're right there. We're knocking on on the door. And if you get a chance, check out keepthefaith.com. Boy, we've got some great great Christmas content, some great Christmas programming on there for you. Uh, Of course, you can listen to our our show on uh, some 300 uh, radio stations across America and in Canada. Um, It's called uh, Keep the Faith. If you don't know where to find it or it's not available to listen to whenever you want to listen to it, just go to keepthefaith.com and we've got some great, great shows just right there. Okay. Really, really, really appreciate y'all. Well, I, uh, I guess we, uh, are, are we about, uh, oh my gosh, look at that. I can't, I cannot believe I just got, I'm looking over here. Denise has just put in front of me another box. Let me see what we got here. What do we got? Oh my goodness. Wow. Okay. Uh, now I have something to talk to you the next time around. Mike Lindell has just sent me those, uh, those Giza uh, sheets, you know, the one he uh, plays up on TV? I cannot believe this. Thank you, Mike. I cannot. W- uh, you know what? I'm going to go put these on my bed. He's always touting touting these things and saying that the, the, these are the best sheets uh, that you can get out there. And I, I know for a long time he wanted uh, these incredible sheets, and he finally developed them. And, and, and I will talk about this on an upcoming show. I want to test them out first before I really go into them. But I'm, I'm, just, I, I'm just opening the case right now and touching them. Wow, they are soft. They are pretty daggone incredible. Woo! I cannot wait, to, I cannot wait for my body to be on these things. Yeah, I'm going to. Now, you know. Do you all wash your sheets first before you put them on your bed when when they come in a beautiful package like this, or do you just put them on the bed? You know, I I don't know. You know, when you're a single guy, you know, you don't know a lot of these things. I I guess you can go to, uh, I guess I can go on a what, uh, Google and ask Google or 
uh, you know, ask a lecture or whatever, should I wash my sheets when I first buy them before I put them on the bed? And I'm, I'm sure a lot of you listening right now going, uh, uh, yes, of course, of course. You don't know where those sheets have been. Well, I, I can tell you they're in a nice little package that he puts them in, and it's a protective plastic package. They look daggone fresh out of the uh, – the fields of the the cotton fields of uh, Giza, which is you know it's a region in Egypt. The way he tells it, it's uh, where the Sahara Desert, the Nile River, and the Mediterranean Sea all come together. Uh, I, at least that's the way I've heard him say it before. So uh, we'll see. We'll see how special these sheets happen to be, and uh, I'll, I'll report back to you on that. Okay. Hey, listen, folks. Uh, this has been fun, and I didn't mean to get off on the Giza sheets thing, but. Man, when she brought this thing into my uh, studio here, I'm like, whoa, what's in that package? And, you know, at this time of year, you don't know if it's uh, Christmas goodies, or which I'm not eating. You know, I'm, 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 I'm not doing the sugar thing, but still, man, I get, I get packages with chocolates and this and that and everything else. I, w- I wish somebody would send me some Omaha steaks. You know, it's like, uh, you know, I get all these, these things with carbs in them. So uh, there are certain things I eat and certain things I don't eat, but... Uh, Boy, what a life that would be. What a, what a life that would be, and that is getting on my Giza sheets with my pillow and having a, a nice steak. That sounds good to me. All right, I'm really getting off uh, message here. This has been CIA, Contagious Influences of America. I'm David Sams. We'll see you next time. And remember to go out there and live that life in living color because it sure is a heck of a lot more interesting than living it in black and white. See you next time.